Um, my name is Marcy Stern. Um, I am a certified New York State certified uh, English teacher up in New York. I've um, been teaching. This is, um, sorry to say, my 18th year. Uh, I don't want to sort of admit my age, but uh, my 18th year teaching. Um, and I have two uh, teenage kids. My son's in middle school, in high school, and my daughter's in middle school. Both are honor students and scholar athletes, and keep me extremely busy. Um, I just started working for Learning Liaisons in January and have taught online graduate education classes for the past six or seven years with University of Phoenix and Manhattan College and Fitchburg University in Connecticut and um, Brandman University in California. So, um, and this is a, a brand new company and a brand new webinar series that we're doing here. Um, so the whole, this whole thing is kind of new for all of us, which is kind of cool. Um, so this is the first presentation that we are giving this way, and um, the first one I'm doing this way in this format, so it's kind of interesting for me as well. Um, I think that when we're all talking about education, and there's a whole lot of stuff going on now with Common Core and lots of states with uh, annual performance reviews and so on from the teacher's point of view, and one of the really big components, I would say at least 60%, well, at least 40% of the equation, I know from a teacher's perspective, is what the parents are doing at home and what the parents had been doing ongoing since their children were little. You know, as parents, you have more contact with your kids for a great many more years than the teachers do in the six hours or in the elementary level or the 40 minutes that we see them every day on the secondary level. Um, and so having consistency and reinforcement and advocacy in the home, as far as education goes, really sort of sets the playing field for, for students and how effective they feel as they're trying to acquire academic skills and trying to become the people that we hope they will become when they get older. Um, parents are very much more uh, influential than I think some of them admit to themselves or will agree to. Um, so at the bottom here, I've, I have a PowerPoint presentation that's going to lead us through what I've sort of planned to discuss. But obviously, if there's something that you want to talk about or you have a question or a statement you want to participate, please, you know, please do so. There's only three of us talking now, so it's not that big of a deal to talk at the same time. But um, in that top yellow bar, there's a little thing that looks like a hand, a guy raising his hand. If I'm not letting you get a word in edgewise, and you want to say something. If you click on that, I'll see that you want to say something and turn the floor over to you. Um, up on the left here on the top of your screen, there should be a whole list. I don't know if you can see from your end that I'm highlighting a whole list of files. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Or not. I'm not sure what you Yes, see. I can. OK, so what all these are are uh, websites um, that are, a few of them are links to articles that I have um, pulled out as um, interesting to and pertinent to our discussion. Um, a couple of them are PBS articles um, that, that, that are particularly pointed toward this topic. And then, then a whole bunch of learning styles inventories for high school, middle school, and elementary school age kids, a personality test, strategies for studying for math, science, social studies, English, um, a bunch of different flashcard makers, because I think the kids in the 21st century are so into electronics that having electronic means to personalize and um, use flashcards it was a little more enticing to them than the old school little paper index card thing. Um, and then some quizzes and things like that that help can help you reviewing. And then the last one, two, three, four, five are videos that are YouTube videos, pretty short and interesting about um, what's going on here. OK, we have a hand raised. Gina has raised a hand. Let's see, Gina. Want to say something, Gina? Where is she? Gina. Gina's microphone is Hi. enabled. and. Hi, Gina. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am well. How come we can't see your face? I have my cam off because the kids are around, and I'll probably shut off the mic also. But I did have one question about the article. Sure. Um, are, we going to be able, are we going to be able to access them after the workshop? 
I believe so. I think that they are available here. Um, I can certainly find out from um, Jason Ampel, the, the owner of the company, how to make sure that they are, just in case they aren't. Um, okay. um, there are. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. There are. There's also at the bottom here in the corner in this tiny little box that I'm desperately trying to make larger. Um, the my PowerPoint that you can download from here. Actually, you can download it from the box that we're viewing it here, where I'm sharing it with you, so that you have that uh, saved to your desktop as well. And in that, you'll see that there are live URL links to many of the websites that are listed up here, including the articles. Um, and at the bottom here in the right left-hand corner are um, files that have take-home stuff. There's a whole sheet of um, internet resources that I've made for, for you guys to take home that are organized the same way this big list in the left is, and including some PowerPoint videos that I think are, I mean, um, YouTube videos that I think are pretty interesting. So anyway, so if that answers your question, Gina, then I think we should move on. Um, okay, so uh, as we, we started to talk about parents being their child's first teacher, we know from the, the time that the kids are very small that they're emulating and watching and absorbing like sponges everything that their parents are doing from birth, even in utero really, from birth um, on forward. Uh, they're, they're listening and watching every nuance and picking up language from their parents and older siblings and their environment around them. and. Um, who knows their child better than the parents do? Um, from the very beginning, to, to burgeon the development of language, we should be reading to the kids on a daily basis, to set up books as rewards and presents, to create daily special times for reading, to um, engage them in things that they're interested in. I know my son was extremely interested in trains as a young child, and even though I could care less about trains, I read every book written about trains that I could to him, to engage him in discussion. What did he think the train was going to be doing, and how did he think the story was going to end, and, you know, trying to, to be analytical and pull out um, his thoughts about that, obviously, once he was, had language. When, before, when he was pre-language, they couldn't do that. Um, once the kids are in school, uh, the big thing to do, really, is to establish a daily homework routine. That it's extremely important that the kids see that the parents are not only interested, but are involved in what's going on in school. That they're in contact with the teacher, that they know what's going on, that they're aware of the homework, or that they're aware of what the students are learning. And studies show pretty much that the parents effectiveness in creating this consistency is one of the, the largest determination, determining factors in children's success in, in school. Um, because it establishes to them very early on where their priorities are, what their family belief system is, the value of education, and that translates directly into their own self-efficacy, their own belief that they are valuable in, in this capacity, that they're, they have the ability to be successful. Um, and eventually, it should, it should work toward the parents allowing the, the child to do the work on their own with support, um, with positive reinforcement and encouragement and so on. Um, and I can't really overestimate the value of, of this kind of thing. Um, Role of parents. I kind of got ahead of myself here. Students' perception of his or her parents' interest and value placed on homework and schoolwork is instrumental in the student's own internalization of the value of education. And I see that a lot. I teach high school right now, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And I can pretty much absolutely tell you, especially with my 10th graders, which parents are involved and which parents aren't by just a couple of weeks into the school year, by the amount, uh, by the, the work ethic of the child. You know, that most of the time, it's the parent's involvement and advocacy that determine the student's work ethic. Um, now, according to this article that we have up here, PBS article and the parent's role, if I click on this, we're going to open up to that article, and you're going to lose the visual. So I don't know if you want to do that and then have to navigate back to the classroom. But according to 
these two articles, the article about parents' role and the grade-by-grade -grade learning guide, um, it's important to practice with the students to connect, what, with, with your children rather, to connect what they're doing in the classroom with real-world examples or real-world scenarios. Um, like if you're ordering a pizza, trying to do fractions with an elementary school age kid about eighths and so on and dividing the pizza up. Um, counting change, determining time. Um, all these kind of things can be easily worked into our everyday teachable moments, our everyday living. Um, creating the routine, assisting your, ch your children, trying to avoid distractions, whether it's cell phones or television or the internet, or I know with my high school kids, it's Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all these things that get in the way of what they're doing. Um, I have a, a social network that I run with my classes, and I know that they're not paying attention to what they're supposed to be doing with their posts online, because instead they've got 14 other windows of Facebook and Twitter and everything else opened and YouTube videos and iTunes in the corner. And all these things just serve to distract, uh, what, distract the kids from what they're doing. Um, I did read something very recently that there's no such thing as multitasking, even for grown-ups. This I found fascinating because I've always prided myself on being a multitasker and being able to get multiple things done simultaneously. And according to this new brain research, I don't know how new it is, but it's new to me, um, there's no such thing as multitasking, that your brain cannot do multiple things absolutely simultaneously, that instead your focus shifts back and forth between things very quickly. And so you're being distracted from one thing to focus on something else, and then being distracted from that to focus on something else. So you're shifting gears very quickly, thinking you're doing things simultaneously, but you're not. And all this really does is serve to exhaust your brain and kind of water down your effectiveness at any one task. So instead of focusing on one thing and doing it really well, you're focusing on three or four things and kind of only doing it in a mediocre fashion, um, which kind of tends to make sense. Um, and, and the last thing that PBS suggests is to be a good role model, that you're going to walk the talk and not just talk it. You know, your kids are going to learn how to read, or they're going to learn to like reading because you are reading. They're going to learn how to have a good vocabulary because you use a good vocabulary when speaking with them. They're going to learn how to value education and respect their elders and take out the trash and make their bed and all of those happy things because you're doing it too. Um, I remember years ago, I was at a Walmart, and I was standing on line. I don't know why I'm telling you this story, but I was standing on line, and there was this woman there with her several small elementary school age children, and she was screaming at them at the top of their lungs, at the top of her lungs, and smacking one of them on the butt. And what she was screaming was, don't yell and don't hit your sister. <laughs> so she was not taking this advice. She was not being a good role model because she was doing exactly what she was telling the kids not to do. So what are they going to listen to, her words or her behavior? Obviously her behavior. And they're not going to learn to not do that. OK, next. Um, establish and reinforce a healthy work ethic, which is what we're working towards here teaching and reinforcing positive attitude. It's over time. This is not a one-shot deal. This cannot happen in one year. It cannot happen in one week. It's not going to happen in one marking period. This is over the long haul. The most difficult thing that I have faced as a parent in my 15 years of being a mom is consistency. And whether, you know, whether it's in my classroom being a teacher or it's at home with my kids, in any of our relationships, in any of our friendships, in any of our dealings as humans, uh, the biggest thing that we deal with is consistency, I think. It's easy to do something really well for a short time. How long can you keep it up? But it's that duration of time, that consistency over the long period, that actually reinforces the work ethic, that reinforces the belief system, reinforces the self-efficacy that we're talking about, to internalize that process so that kids can become lifelong learners, so that kids can do this on their own. I mean, ultimately, our job as parents is to render ourselves useless. You know, if we've done our job right, then our kids don't need us anymore. It's kind of sad, but it's the truth. All right, positive skills, study skills, and techniques at home. Um, what parents need to know, what teachers want them to know, is that, and my, my screen is very small, 
is that um, when it comes to being at home and having the routine, that there are some basic things that need to happen. Um, you know the flow of your house. You know the kind of environment that you have in your home. Um, you have to work with your child and establish a location, an environment within the house that is conducive to focus, it's conducive to minimizing distractions, conducive to um, doing their homework. Whether you're going to set your kid up in a desk in his or her room, or at the kitchen table, or at the dining room table, which is where I make my kids do their homework still. I don't let them go in their rooms because I'm afraid they're going to be on Facebook or Instagram or playing on their iPods or any of that. Um, you want to eliminate the distractions. Try to excite them with what they're doing. Show your engagement and excitement in what it is they're learning. Have them explain to you what's going on and how what they're learning and what their teachers are talking to them about. Make sure you have all the supplies that they need. Um, books, pens, paper, computers, whatever it is that they need. Supplies are important to try to minimize the amount of time that they have or transition between, between activities and so on. Um, you want to make sure that you're communicating with the kid's teacher. A lot of times with elementary school kids, there's communication in an agenda that's sent home. So if there are any notes that the teacher sent home, you want to keep up on all of that stuff. Make sure your children know how from a young age to keep a notebook organized. And you're going to have to step in and show them how to do that. Kids don't learn how to do that in a vacuum. And I don't really think most teachers have the time to do that in a classroom when they have 30 kids um, that they have to address every day. Positive study skills at school. Now, these are things that you can have that teach your child to, to do actively in the classroom that will help build up their self-esteem, build up their, their, their positive performance in the classroom. The first is participate in class and ask questions. Um, class teachers from the beginning of time have always given, given participation grades. Last several years, I've changed this in my classroom. I don't call it participation anymore because that's kind of vague. If a kid raises his hand, or a kid hands out paper, or a kid talks in a small group, it's considered participation. But instead, I've been calling it work ethic. Are you consistent? Are you reliable? Can you, can you um, manage your own responsibilities, et cetera? Um, and it's important to ask questions. Plenty of kids sit there with their hands under their tush, and they don't actually ask questions, even though they have them. Um, and there's a whole lot of social reasons for this. We could probably have a whole other webinar just on that alone. Um, you know, girls tend to not ask questions because they're afraid that the boys are going to think they're smart. And God forbid the boys think they're smart, they won't be attractive. And the boys don't want to ask questions because they don't want to look stupid in front of their guys. You know? And a whole host of other reasons. That's way oversimplifying. Um, but you want them to ask questions. Um, what's the cliche? There's no, the only stupid question is the one that's not asked. Something like that. Anyway, um, you want your children to learn how to take good notes. And you can show them how to do this, how to highlight important vocabulary words, how to write down their homework assignments every day. Um, um, something as your kids get a little older and their teachers are allowing them to pick their own groups for cooperative learning or their own groups in group work, make sure that they pick groups wisely, not just to be with their friends and have a good time, but to pick students or you know, classmates who are going to be in their groups who are actually going to do the work, actually going to be effective. Um, I find that one of the biggest roadblocks to getting students to work cooperatively with each other is the fact that there are some kids who kind of ride on the coattails of the more motivated kids with the better work ethics. And then those kids are resentful because they have to share their grade with the kid who sponged off of all of their hard work. Um, so if they pick good groups from the beginning, then they will be able to avoid that as a problem. Um, and another, the last thing I added here is to understand what question verbs are. Um, I spent a lot of time recently with my 10th graders because they didn't seem to understand basic commands or question words like describe or contrast or summarize or generalize or predict. And I was under the assumption that they knew what those words were asking them to do. And it was an incorrect assumption, because it was the worst quiz grade they had all year. Um, so I think from the beginning, from the time they're very small little first graders, reinforcing with them at school and at home, 
and we see word problems in math, or we see questions in science, or social studies, textbook questions as we get into DBQs in middle school especially, um, and in English uh, literary analysis question. What are we asking the kids to do? They can't do the task if they don't know what we're asking. Okay, um, learning styles. Now this is a really big thing that I don't think even a lot of teachers take advantage of, but there's a whole, there's a, a quite a few educational theorists uh, philosophical, uh, psychological, educational theorist. Some um, Howard Gardner is one of them. They sort of they have this theory that I prescribe to, subscribe to, um, of multiple intelligences. That everybody learns differently. That you acquire knowledge in different ways. And there are two. Oh, I'm hearing myself now. Um, and you can determine if you can't figure out based on your kid's own behavior. You can determine what your child's own learning style is and. Over here on this, this URL list, I have, that might help, I have learning styles inventories for high school, middle school, and elementary school age children. And you can ask your child or sit with your child and have your child take one of these tests. Oh, Gina's here. Hi, Gina. I'm here, I'm too. here too. Good to see you. Oh, yay! I don't know what's going on here. It's all like blurry all of a sudden. The sound is all strange. Feedback. Let me see if I can fix this. Just lower your volume a little bit. Is that any better? Can you guys still hear me? It's still getting feedback, but it's not annoying me as much. Do you guys hear the feedback? No? Yeah? No. Good. Okay. I like that. Gina's listening. Okay. So learning styles. We have three main learning styles. Auditory, which means that they learn through hearing and auditory input. Visual learners learn primarily through seeing and visual input. I'm a visual learner. And kinesthetic learners learn through movement when coordinating learning or studying with movement. Um, there was a movie a few years ago called Aquila and the Bee about a cute little girl who um, was in a spelling bee. Gina's shaking her head. She saw the movie. Um, and she could spell the word better when there was movement involved. I think she was on, a, on a, a jump rope, wasn't she? There was another kid with a basketball. But I think she had a jump rope. And she could spell any word as long as she was jumping. As soon as she took her jump rope away, forget it. She couldn't spell anything, or at least not as well. So she's definitely a kinesthetic learner. She's able to acquire, memorize, study, as long as there's movement associated with it. So um, as teachers, I think it's very important that we learn the learning styles of our students, learn our own learning styles, because that's also how we teach. But by learning our students' learning styles, we can then present the lessons, the information, the content, the skills in ways, in multiple ways, that, that accommodate those modalities, those learning styles. But as a parent, I think that that information is equally as valuable because you can then teach your child study skills, study habits that work well with his or her specific brain. So just because flashcards work well with me because I'm a visual learner does not mean that it's going to work well with my son. And it didn't because he's not a visual learner. He's a kinesthetic learner. My daughter is a visual learner, so flashcards work great with her. Um, so here, we have visual learners first. They learn by reading and seeing pictures, understanding and remembering things by sight, picturing what she or he is learning, seeing what they're learning. So you can ask your child, even if you're doing math or you're doing social studies or science, to visualize what do they see. Um, what is pictured in, in what, what pictures come to mind when reading this passage, or what pictures, um, to try to picture what the math problem is asking them to do. Asking the child to look at the question from a visual sense will help a visual learner. <laughs> to, maximize, to maximize the skills of a visual learner, they should sit in the front of the classroom to avoid distractions. They can use flashcards, visualize things that they hear and see, write down keywords, ideas, or instructions. Um, as a kid, I was able to actually memorize where on the page the notes were because I rewrote them. And seeing that in my mind helped me remember what I was doing. 
Um, they can draw pictures to explain new concepts and then explain the pictures. Um, I frequently have students draw four to six box cartoons about literature that we read, short stories, scenes and plays, etc. And the, just the act of drawing the cartoon, even if it's just stick figures, artistic merit's not necessary, as long as they're able to depict their, what they're talking about or the concept or the skill, they're, they're able to visualize it and it, it gets embedded into their brains. Color coding works really well for visual learners like me. Um, I do that with my classes. I teach five classes a day. Each class gets a different color. It just helps me focus and figure out what it is I'm doing. Um, remember that you need to see things and not just hear things to learn well. So um, visual learner would be great if they had the directions or the, the assignment in front of them and you helped them read it or read it out loud. So you know, using multiple modalities at once definitely helps. Um, when studying, a visual learner might want to read their notes out loud to a parent. And the act of reading the notes out loud, um, visualizing, reading the content again, helps embed it into their brain. Um, and then using mnemonic devices. I remember having to learn the music notes, every good boy deserves fun. You know, remember that one? Or putting the first letters of every word together, E, e B, what is it, E, G, B, D, F, gives the music students the notes of the treble clef. But knowing the mnemonic device can help them remember what's going on. Auditory learners learn by hearing and listening, understanding and remembering things that are heard, and they store information by the way it sounds. Um, so when you're reading directions, it's better for them to hear it than necessarily to just see it. Um, but obviously, just like with the, like I said with the visual learner, doing both modalities simultaneously will definitely help. Reading out loud. Um, I have a bunch of auditory learners in my 10th grade inclusion class. And when we read To Kill a Mockingbird, the book was just too long and the vocabulary was too difficult for them. So I provided them with an audio book. And for some of them, it was the only way they got through the novel, was to listen as well as read to somebody else who was, was, who was performing the book for them. And, and that was how they got through the book. Um, I know I'll, wh wherever I can, I pr try to produce the auditory, the, the audio book for the kids. So if you have an auditory learner as a child, when you're sitting down with him or her doing homework, reading the assignment out loud, whether you're reading it to him or her, if they're a very young kid, or as the kids get older, having them read the directions to you or read the problems out loud to you, sometimes it's just enough to crystallize the understanding. If they're doing it all in their head, especially word problems in math, um, understanding a sub the content of a subject that doesn't come naturally to them, maybe they're not science-minded or social studies is confusing with facts, reading the content out loud solidifies it in their brain in a different way and sometimes can get them to understand it, the content or the skill, without you having to help them su supply it by supplying it. Okay. So I think I just went through almost all of these before I got to the slide. Sit where you can hear in the classroom. Use flashcards and read them out loud. Reading stories and assignments and directions out loud. Record yourself. This is a little 21st century skill. They can record themselves spelling words or performing their notes or reviewing and then listen to it again. I know lots of us, I mean, we're all on this technology right now, so why not use the microphone or um, uh, some digital recorder. I know there are apps everywhere. I have an app on my iPhone that I can record myself with a, with a touch of a button. Why not give that to your kid, put, it on, put the app on his or her iPod, and have them record themselves explaining something or reading something and then listen back. It's their own voice. They get to read it and listen to it. Multiple modalities all at once. Um, the next is a tactile kinesthetic learner. This is touching, doing, moving, building, drawing, jumping rope, bouncing a basketball, whatever they need to do. Things are remembered, internalized, studied, learned through physical activity. So what do we do with these children? Um, we have them participate in activities that involve touching and building and moving and drawing. Maybe it's building out of clay the structure, a biological structure that they're studying for science, or building out of popsicle sticks what um, the Battle of the Alamo looked like for social studies, or um, bouncing a ball or jumping a jump rope while trying to learn a specific task or skill. Um, keeping things hands-on, art projects, going on walks, acting out stories, 
doing plays, moving around in the, in the, in the home. Um, anything that sort of links any sort of physical activity with the brain activity is going to uh, be uh, successful or help the success of a tactile kinesthetic learner. Also taking breaks. I think this applies to everybody, but I have it on this slide. Taking breaks during reading or studying. Um, not too long of a break, but a little bit can also be a kind of a healthy thing. Um, even something very simple, I read an article that if the kids just tap a pencil or they tap their foot and they have a rhythm going, just even the movement of that can help seed an idea or a memory or um, a con content in their brain. Okay, um, learning styles inventories. Like I said, there's a bunch of, there are three high school ones that you have access to here. There are two middle school ones. And depending on who your kid is and the, the um, sophistication of their language and their thought process, the middle school ones and the high school ones could be almost interchangeable. The elementary school ones are a little easier. Um, and then there are also a few um, elementary age ones that were more pictorially organized for pre-readers. But the few that I found had subscription costs and fees involved, so I really didn't, I didn't want to put them up here. All I have here are the ones that are free. Um, and by sitting down with your child and having your child do one of these, uh, you can learn a whole lot about who they are. Another thing that I do with my students, and I also made my kids do recently, um, was a young Myers-Briggs personality test. Um, there's a, a video here that's a couple of minutes long called Learning called Discover Your Personality Type. It's the very last video here. Um, it basically goes through the four personality types. Um, and by doing this, it's a 72 or 74 question inventory. And it asks, would you rather do this or that? Are you happier in a group or happier by yourself? Are you happy working with others or happy being responsible for your own your own uh, activity. And by answering these kinds of questions, they figure out how you feel about whether you're an introvert or extrovert, whether you um, learn things by judging or sensing, or if you're intuitive, et cetera. I'm doing a very lousy job explaining this, but these four personality characteristics can um, wind up in 16 different personality types. I happen to be. Um, an ESFJ, and my son is an ENTJ, which was very surprising because I thought it was going to come out very differently. Um, so that's, I'm going too fast. So um, it's, the website here is human extrovert part of the, the result to determine how I do groupings so that I don't put all introverts in one group and all extroverts in another group and then nobody speaks. I like to blend them. Um, and I think that as a parent, it could be a cool thing. And Jason Ampel has raised his hand. I have a question. Can, question. Can, you Can you hear me? Yep. yep. It's very blurry. I mean, fuzzy, but Can no. you hear me? Um, maybe you could explain what those letters stand for for some of the people. Maybe they haven't taken that test. Yeah, you know, my, my, um, um, oh, Eric's an INFJ. You knew that already? James is typing. He's aware of them. Okay. Gina is writing something, I think. Looks like she's typing. And you do too. Elizabeth, have you seen these before? Okay, um, the letters. Ooh, it's more feedback, more feedback. I don't really, you know, have notes on this. I didn't memorize all of this. Um, I, the, the E and the I would be introvert or extrovert. Um, the N really stands for intuitive versus um, S would be sensing, would be the other thing. Um, there's T and the J. Truthfully, I sound like I have no idea what I'm talking about because my mind is going blank. Um, But they do a much better job at explaining all of this on the website. Um, I have the information that I have shared with you here can help. I don't really want to take the time now and show you the video when you can look at it yourself. They do a much better job at explaining this than I do. Um, 
What else do we have? The SQ4R method of studying. This is something you can do with your kids at home. Surveying them, questioning them, having them recite and rewrite something and then review. And it's just five basic steps that it's easy to remember SQ4R um, and, and uh, it's just something that you can do at home with your kids. Um, here's a reading comprehension graphic organizer just by having them get used to answering questions about the subject. What's going on? Who is this involving? What is the, what's the basic theme here? The occasion would be a setting or a time and a place. Who the audience of something is. The purpose of the piece that you're reading. Whether it's nonfiction, it's meant to persuade, it's an advocacy thing. They're trying to help other people. Um, it's trying to provide information and so on. Who the speaker is and what the tone is. Um, which is what kind of mood the speaker's in, what kind of, whether it's, it's relaxed or it's, it's fancy or formal or um, et cetera. Um, but just asking these kinds of questions and sometimes organizing it in a graphic way can help kids realize that they know more about what it is they're studying or trying to learn than they think they do. And a lot of times kids really just assume that they know nothing when they really know more than they think. Um, another one is called SIFT which I use in my class sometimes. Um, symbol, examining the title and text for symbolism. Images, identifying imagery and sensory details. Figures of speech, analyzing figurative language, metaphors, similes, um, et cetera. And tone and theme, how all the devices reveal tone and theme. The, the, the basic ideas, the main ideas of something, and um, the kind of um, um, formality or informality, the kind of seriousness or whimsical or funny or gothic or whatever. Um, there's a lot of, of, of tones things can have. Um, and again, by organizing it graphically can help the visual learner. And um, to, uh, to organize what's going on here, Jason just posted something that all you have to do is click on the resource page here and it will download to your PC. So any of the things that are here, you can you can save on your own on your desktop. Um, study tip websites, again, are all on this list here on the left. Um, and if you download the um, PowerPoint, you have most of them here. Um, math strategies, science strategies, these, these sites are here um, with a basic Google search. And you can get a plethora of things to just sift through. Most of them are free. There are some things that are not what they look they look like they're going to be, and there are some things that do have subscriptions. Um, all of these are free, and they have a lot of different kinds of strategies, lots of quizzes, um, lots of additional help that parents can use with their kids in the class in, in their in their homes, um, and that they can use on their own. Some of them are uh, geared toward different age groups. Um, um, and this last one here, this multiple subject test practice samples, they have literally every subject that a kid would face in, in face or, or discover in class is all here. Um, I could share one of these with you. Are we going to, are we feeling brave? Do we want to take a look at a URL and then navigate our way back? Do we feel comfortable with that or do you not want to do that? Any response? OK, no response. Let's get dangerous. OK, so let's take a look. Let's, uh, let's try this multi-subject one. Or let's try, let's try the math strategies one. So if we browse to, now we're going to open up this math strategies website, hopefully. It's not taking us there. That's no, not working. Let's try the science one. Let's work this afternoon. It's not going behind. All right, nobody go anywhere. We're all still here. Let's see if we can get something working. OK, well, the PBS guide, grade by grade guide works. So there's a lot here. Uh, it's a very interesting article. It goes through pre-K to fifth grade, et cetera. Um, 
Let's see what else works. I don't know why these aren't working. I'm a little embarrassed, actually. All right, the English zone. English zone works. Okay, so here we've got language learning, uh, note-taking symbols, preparing for tests, signal words and note-taking, preparing for essay tests, reading tips, vocabulary. So um, here's the SQ3R over here is on, he on this one, where she can give you some strategies for how to use this in your, in, in your house. With your, with your student questions, read, recite, review, etc. It's kind of interesting. Um, let's see what else we have here. Lang note taking symbols. I don't know how useful this is. Math symbols. Initials and abbreviations. Basically what I want, what, what, what I'm trying to get at with this is that there are a lot of resources out there for a savvy parent. Um, getting into the flashcard thing that we did, we did sort of mention before, um, I have, I always have a big stack right here on my desk of these old, old, old fashioned flashcards. My daughter uses them for Spanish, she uses them for science words, she uses them for social studies. She likes the flashcard that she can hold in her hand. My son, on the other hand, is not so interested in flashcards at all, but will use electronic digital versions of them on the computer um, if I sort of tell him that he needs to, it's important. Um, so the flashcards are kind of conducive to studying almost any kind of subject, and we have uh, several websites that can help with that. Um, my father keeps texting me. Okay, so of course we have the old school one. We also have the flashcard exchange. Why don't we take a look at that? Let's see if that opens. Flashcard exchange um, gives us the ability to look at a whole lot of flashcards for, for different specific subjects. And they have predetermined, pre-created flashcards. Or if you click over here where it says create your own flashcard, you can create your own set. Put your own title, your own subject, um, a description of that, and then actually create the front and the back of each of the flashcards, and then show them to yourself and play with them. And then you can save it and then and cre actually create it and then play with them here, um, which is kind of interesting, I think. One of my students actually showed me that one. Flashcard Machine is online, and it's also avo um, available as an app for most smartphones, for Android phones and iPhones. It's free. It's web-based. You can create your own flashcards and then share them with classmates. So I have some students who are using this one as well, and then they're, they're sharing their flashcards with each other. So it becomes a social thing. It's also academic. It's kind of fun. Um, and flashcards here, the second one here, is uh, available on the iTunes App Store for iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch. And it's uh, a studying application. Any standardized test, any subject, um, and they can study right on their Apple-enabled um, smartphone or iOS device, I should say. Um, there's also, you can create PowerPoint flashcards and just use Microsoft Office's PowerPoint to, to create flashcards themselves um, and then just go through them that way. If somebody's interested in this, I have a template. I didn't actually upload it here, but I could create a pod and share. Let's do that right now. I'll share a document. I'll put up one of my PowerPoint flashcards that I use for vocabulary with my own teaching. and. Um, you can very easily use the same template and just change the words themselves. I can find one. Here. Here's a To Kill a Mockingbird vocabulary flashcard. So if you're interested in using this, you can take the same uh, PowerPoint and just resave it under a different name and change all the words in the definition. It's a little time consuming at first, but if you have an older kid, even middle school age kid, you can have your, your child type in the words in the definition so they get the process of doing it the first time. Um, and then as they're practicing with the, the little, with the program itself, then it reinforces things. So this is going to finish uploading and converting and then you can 
um, save that if you want and then have the template. Um, that would be kind of helpful, I think. Um, there's another website called Quizlet.com that offers free, custom, self-made flashcards for every major subject. It does quizzing, it has matching games, and it keeps score. So um, that's another interesting thing that we have here. Um, then websites for learning and review quizzes. Um, I like to learn.com, quizhub, quiztree.com. From elementary school to high school physics, they have quizzes that you can take that can help your child study and reinforce what, what he or she is learning. Um, and another big thing in this whole this era of APPR and Common Core testing and so on, where we're testing kids standardized cumulative tests every year, is this combating test anxiety. I know there are a lot of students who get freaked out by all of these tests, and they're losing sleep, and they're getting themselves stomach aches, and they're not eating well. And you know, there's a lot of pressure on us teachers. There's also a lot of pressure on the students. And um, there was a little bit of a movement, a little blurb. I don't know if you guys felt the ripple of this, where um, there were student uh, parents, actually, who were having their kids kind of refuse to take the tests recently. Um, I see Gina's eyebrows went up. Yeah, there was a little bit of a, a movement where there were teachers, there were parents who were having their kids not take the tests. You know, you go into school and they have to sit in the classroom for the two hours or three hours with their hands in their laps, but they were kind of refusing to take the tests. And there wasn't anything that the teachers or the, 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 the school could sort of do about it. You know, and what's the state going to do about it? I don't know. I don't know if it went on. I, I don't know where you guys are, if you're in Florida or whatever, but I'm in New York, and there was a big, not a big issue, but, you know, it was enough where our school district felt that they had to say something officially to us about, you know, what we were allowed to say or not allowed to say with, tids, with kids who were refusing to take the tests. But as parents, what can we do? Um, obviously, you want your kid to try his or her best. Obviously, you want your child to put his, best, his or her best foot forward. But we really don't want them to be anxious. It doesn't do anybody any good service if the kids are anxious. Um, so what do they do? Biologically, physiologically, get, make sure they get enough sleep, make sure they're well hydrated, make sure they have a good breakfast in the morning before they go into class, um, make sure that over time they've been keeping up with their homework and keeping up with their studying so that they feel on top of and in control of what it is they're learning. That will definitely help. Um, so that they're not cramming it all in the night before, which always makes everybody anxious. Um, and even just talking positively about the test itself, you know, um, can, make, can make your child feel less anxious about it. I, I know with a lot of these tests that are going on right now that it, it's sort of testing what the kids know, but it's also testing how the school district prepares and what the curriculum is like and the performance of the teacher and so on. And I think a lot of the tests nowadays are focused on evaluating the teachers and the curriculum. And the only way that these people can figure out how to do that, I don't agree with any of this, don't get me started, is by testing the students more. And somehow if we test the hell out of our students, somehow it's going to yield more information about whether the teachers are effective or not. Um, I think there are better ways to address teacher effectiveness than to drive the students crazy, or the parents by extension. Um, when the students are actually in front of the tests, how do they decrease their own anxiety level? Focus on directions. Again, making sure they know exactly what's being asked. Making sure the students are on time for the tests, maybe even a little early so they have Time to sit and get themselves organized, make sure they're in the right classroom, make sure they have pencils and tissues and water or whatever else that they need. Um, pace themselves. Don't rush. Focus on what you know. Try not to get distracted. These are all things that you can tell your, your son or daughter before he or she goes off to school. And here's another big one, number nine. Use all the time you're given. Do not try to finish early. Do not be the first one to hand the test in. If anything, be the very last person to hand the test in. Um, I think test designers design tests to take assessments to take a certain period of time. And they know how long it should take the, a person to take the test. And that's the amount of time that they give you. So use the time. The proctor or the teacher is stuck in the room for that period of time anyway. You're not keeping them any longer. Um, and I, I make sure I tell my biological children this and my students this. Um, and parental influence. We really can't discount 
how much of an effect that we as parents have on our children's education. It's extremely important. I know the parents who are too busy or don't have enough time or aren't interested or have too many kids to handle or you know a whole host of other problems, financial, social, familial, um, domestic, that get in the way really affect how the kids learn in the classroom and how they what kind of a learner they become and then eventually how successful they are later in their high school career or in higher education and so on. And we need to, we need to build a strong work ethic. We need to be strong, involved, vocal advocates for our children to teach them how to do this on their own. Ultimately, what's the goal in parenthood? We said this in the beginning, to render ourselves useless. And the only way to do that is to pass all of this forward. So we have four minutes left. I didn't think I could talk for an hour, but I did. Um, Anybody have any questions or comments or anything you want to talk about that I didn't address? Eric has raised his hand. Let's enable his microphone. Somehow, if not, there we go. Yeah, I see it. I hear it now. Um, I, it should be enabled right now. Um, the major thing that occurs with a lot of uh, a lot of parents out there today that are not involved, um, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if they are trying to play games, but it's like they don't want to educate themselves on the issues that are occurring. They don't want to, they do not want to, um, some, for example, they're, uh, and I have the an, I a 1980s edition. Well, that happens. I mean, I, with a few times that I've taught Huckleberry Finn, I've had problems with parents having trouble with the N-word. Um, I also teach a color purple to my 11-H groups. Um, and it's pretty violent against women. It's pretty violent and racist, and their N-word is all over the place. And But it's a Pulitzer Prize winning NCTA defended um, wonderful piece of literature and I've had parents complain before they've read it or before they've gone all the way through. Um, how do you combat that? Intelligently, giving them articles, get, making sure that they understand that you as the teacher have researched and know what the content is, that you have a goal involved in mind. And you know, how do we learn how to not be a society that is racist or sexist or misogynist or you know, um, who, who uh, racially stereotypes certain people. How do we learn how to not do that? One of the ways is by learning who we used to be, our own history, and by knowing what used to be and how awful that was, we can make decisions as a culture to not be that way now. And how do we learn history? Sometimes it's through a social studies teacher or a history book or an article or a YouTube video, but sometimes it's through literature. It's through the experience of our culture through literature that teaches us how people behaved under um, a racist regime like the South in pre-Civil War time. You know? Does that help, Eric? No. That really, that my my concern. What I was I was trying to allude that I was trying to tie that into even the testing. The fact of the matter is, I've met too many too many parents right. like that. The issue at Walmart. I actually I I work the back room there. I know what it's like to be in that place. Uh, let me use that because I have tons of experience. Doctor Ample knows because I brought in plenty of horror stories to his class. Uh, he, um, sorry, not him, the, a lot of the parents, uh, out there, um, you can just tell, like, they, um, they're surprised that their, 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 their children are acting a certain way, but when I'm, when, uh, when, I, not only do they act that, not only are they acting up because of what parents do My in classroom. the house right. and private, but they're also doing some of the same doggone things 
in public. Yeah, not I'm not even the classroom, but exactly. A lot of the, the the kids learn the behaviors from the parent, and then you hear the parent on the phone calling the teacher to complain, and it's you know you see the apple does not fall far from the tree. How do you combat that? I don't know. That's a good question, Eric. Anyone have any help? Any suggestions? Gina, Elizabeth, do you have any experience with this? Elizabeth, we can't hear you. I see you talking, but I don't hear you. Make sure your microphone is enabled on your side. Now we've got you. It's on now. OK. I think it's on now. I, I think comments are spot on, and it's it's absolutely yeah. frightening to go into public and see how some parents do interact with their children. Um, it's, it's shocking. We lived overseas for 25 years, and we've come back to a third world country. We lived in a third world country for 25 years. We've come back to a third world country, which is absolutely starts at home. That's where the kids learn the behavior. It's the way people treat each and other. it's cyclical. And it you know, if, if there's no place for the, the children to learn something new or the parents to change and be aware, self-reflective and learn their, where to, how to change their behavior, it's just going to keep going on for subsequent generations. I don't know. <laughs> it's a scary thing. The people, those of us that are parents, Absolutely. have to want to change. That's the tough part. I mean, most people are pretty stuck into that uh, I am what I am and bugger the rest of you. Absolutely. That's, that's so that, my observation after having been back. Even if they years. are, and some of them might not even be aware that that's there it. is an issue. This is the way they were. This is the way their parents were. That's good enough for them. And they don't know that there's any other way to be. So it's, it's acknowledgment as well as desire to change. It would be nice if, you know, <laughs> we could make them change, but we can't. Our only hope, really, is to try to have as much influence on their kids as we can. What, Elizabeth? We'll send Eric out with Kim. I, I think yeah. if people saw themselves in these CAMCOMs, they would be shocked. Yeah, I agree. This is I what agree. the rest Maybe of the world sees. Shock them into reality, show them what they're doing. Um, anyone else have anything they want to share? So we're now ring the end of the hour. I just want to that this has been very helpful to me. One of the things that has managed to yeah. knock me square on the head is the necessity for routine. I find this very difficult with a teenager and all the distractions and all the other things that seem to be ever so important to the family life and the kids' life and the house and the dogs and the husband and everything else that goes on. Um, my husband travels a lot, and so there's there right. are lots of disruptions. It's not a normal household, and I think that what has helped we me all to, need reminders. to do is to recognize and remember. And I knew this, but sometimes yeah. it happens. Well, I'm glad. Um, I'm glad. I struggle with my son because he, you know, he's had a 97 average. He's in honors classes. I cannot be more proud of him academically, but. What does he do with his spare time but play Call of Duty on his Xbox? You know, he could lose days on Call of Duty. I, I don't understand at all, but I have to structure it. I have to limit it. He gets a certain amount of time, and then he has to read a certain amount of actual text. I don't care if it's a, a, a novel. I don't care if it's for school. I don't care if it's a, a magazine about cars or popular science, which luckily he likes, he has to read for an hour every day or he loses the Xbox time. But I have to structure that. You know, I've learned that with him I have to write down chores. I can't just say, remember the garbage has to go out, it's Tuesday night, it's coming on Wednesday. I actually have to either text him, which is the best thing because he's always got his phone, and give him a list of chores when he gets home from school because he gets home half an hour before I do. So you do your homework, and then the garbage has to go out, and you have to, you know, change the bird, clean out the bird cage, and whatever else, you know, little sundry list I, I give him, laundry, whatever. But if I don't write it down, it doesn't get done. 
So, you know, maybe that'll help. Leave a note, text him, you know. Sometimes I even text him in Spanish, even though my Spanish is in. What? You want to text him? You know, you got to talk to them where they are. Meet them where they are. And they're so technology-based, then use the technology to get to them. You know? Use it for good instead of evil. I joke about that all the time. All right, so if there's nothing else, then... Yes, Elizabeth? It's also a... Go ahead. I was just going to say yes. that... Um, I do find it, I'm glad. It, at least you're documented Good. as to what needs Eric's to be done. Eric's hand is raised again, or is that still yes. from before? Well, actually, it, it's it's from now. The um, the one thing I can say is uh, you can actually make. Um, I I was. I was actually talking to a guy that he he's a he's more the he deals more he's a teacher that deals more with science, but he came up with a really cool idea, which is to um, is to make the point system and the and the corrective system more video game based, sort of uh, where they would get experience certain experience points for for doing certain things. Uh, and re uh, it like helps, and it helps reinforce behavior uh, that you want reinforced, and it helps elite eliminate behavior that you don't want uh, reinforced. It's pretty cool because uh, they they're now it, it also gets them involved. So it's pretty cool that you can actually uh, even you can even adapt. A literary piece. Is it, are you we referencing a specific website or application or something, or or you just it's just theoretical? Oh, really? That's very cool. I remember last year, the year before, hearing about a video game on like an internet base, like on the computer video game, that I, I have. I'm just remembering it now. That that had um, that taught kids skill sets of organizing themselves socially to, to um, fulfill a common goal, whether they were saving a planet or learning how to recycle. There was something about some sort of environmental awareness or something as part of the game. But it, it used the game to teach skills that the kids would then you know, emulate in real life. Interesting. Game theory. Cool. I'm sure there are articles about that. You should look that up. Anyone else? Um, I know James was typing something on the bottom here. That technology is definitely a valuable tool. I would say many children and students suffer motivational issues. Yeah, I think we are also distracted. I suspect your child isn't interested in his chores and he feels no ownership over them. Is this directed toward me, James? Probably. He isn't doing them to enrich himself. Extrinsic motivation also undermines long-term efforts. Yeah, he's doing this so he doesn't get in trouble. He'll do the chores so that his mom doesn't bark at him and he gets more Xbox time. I absolutely know that. No 15-year-old boy wants to take the garbage out or put his laundry away. But, you know, maybe by teaching him to do that and asking him to do that, he'll know that it needs to be done when he's running his own household. You know, these things don't happen on their own. Or eat vegetables. No, he actually likes vegetables. He's very health conscious. Will not eat things that he doesn't want to. Uh, that, that aren't healthy and is very health conscious about what he eats. So the vegetable thing I have to disagree with because he'd eat those even if I didn't say anything. All right, Jason's saying he doesn't like to do chores and he's 36. Okay. But you know that you're supposed to do them and when you're running your household, the laundry doesn't do itself and the garbage won't take itself out. So it's something we know, we know need to, we all need to learn. Um, Hugh is here as a comment. This is very informative as I'm a new parent. This is going to be something I will have to tackle in the years to come. Um, I can't, for Hugh, if you're, if you're a brand new parent, that I cannot um, um, overstate the importance of reading. And reading to your child, providing books, keeping them out, having them get ready access to books, things that are interested in what it, that they find interesting when you configure that out. Um, making, setting it up as a reward system. 
I used to read three books to each one of my kids as toddlers every single night before bed. And if they were bad during the day or they did a behavior that I didn't like, I was able to take away or threaten to take away one of the three storybooks at night. And it became such a wonderful time for them that just threatening to take a book away would get their behavior to change. And that just may be particular to my odd children that take after their geeky mother. But, um, but it worked like a charm. So, you know, why not try it? I agree reading in the early years makes an amazing difference. It does. Emerging literacy, um, teaches them vocabulary skills, sentence construction, meaning, um, human reactions, behaviors, etc. You know, people write about everything, so we can learn everything from reading. All right, it is 9-11. I think we're going to end the session. Um, I hope you all had a good, as good a time as I did. Um, I will make sure that these things are available to you. You'll have the video available on the site. Um, I think we may even, uh, well, we have the video available for you. As well, oh, Jason says he's going to send everyone a recording. That's what I was about to say and cut myself off. Um, and you have, you can down, have the ability to download the PowerPoint and the flashcard PowerPoint thing here. Um, and you'll have access to all of these, um, all of these websites and the little resources that I have here on the bottom. So I hope you all had fun and tell your friends all about learning liaisons because you're going to be doing lots of stuff like this in the future. Um, keep, uh, keep, us, keep us on your Facebook page, folks. Jason's typing something. Dr. Ampel is saying, awesome job. I think we all did an awesome job. Thank you all for coming. It was a pleasure to meet you all. Have a good evening. Bye. <laughs>